Okay, so it is 6.02, so I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone, my name is Krista Seringo, and I am the chair of the Community Engagement Committee for the Mount Aid School Board, and I'm also a representative from the town of Bristol. And first, I just wanna thank everyone for being here with us this evening. I really appreciate, in fact, the whole board appreciates the fact that so many of our community members are tuning into what's a really important conversation about the future of our school district. Um, we would like to just take a few minutes before we get into the presentation to talk about our process and clarify where we're at in that. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. Okay. Um, Shannon, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. All right, so I know some folks um, are here this evening that may have been at our board meeting on uh, December 7th, that was last Monday, where Superintendent Patrick Green presented a recommendation to, this, to the school board. And that recommendation um, included lots of background information and context about how we've been working through this process that the board has been grappling with for about 18 months or so, as we've really come to recognize that we are um, facing some significant financial challenges due to declining enrollment and increasing costs. And we engaged with the community um, in a number of ways last fall, and that generated lots of different options for consideration and further study into those options, um, which all led to the presentation to the board on Monday. At that time, that was really a, a, a meeting for the board. There was some opportunity for public comment, but it was primarily um, a school board's chance, board member's chance to ask questions and make comments about that recommendation. And um, yesterday morning, we had over 50 or so folks here. And then this evening, um, we're offering two opportunities for the community to hear a abbreviated version of that presentation and to have a chance to ask your questions and share your comments. Um, it's an abbreviated presentation because we really do wanna make sure we create enough space for folks to ask questions. Um, but if there's any information that you are still seeking um, or you have additional questions after this meeting, there's opportunity to ask those. So um, I'd like to share a little bit about what's going to happen next. Um, the school board is then um, submitting a survey to the community uh, or distributing a survey, which you may have already seen come out electronically and it's also coming out in the mail. And um, that survey has about a four week window of time for folks to complete it. And it's our hope that as many members of the five town community can complete that survey to give the board a really robust and um, diverse um, set of input to look at um, as we think about our next steps. And I just wanna clarify that there have been no decisions made at this point about what we may do with our schools and our facilities moving forward. The board is still very much in the information gathering phase. Um, we've got the recommendation from the superintendent consider to consider. We've got lots of information that is accompanying that recommendation. Um, and the survey is really the community's chance to add your direct input into all of this. At a meeting on January 20th, um, that is a meeting specifically for the board to look at that survey data um, and to um, have a discussion about what we might do next. That discussion may lead to a recommendation to put a vote out to the community members, which um, right now our timeline is that that would happen around um, town meeting day, we might decide to do something else or nothing at all at this time. Um, so again, your input is really important. Um, if you have questions that are not answered tonight, we've set up an email address and you can see that on the screen here. And then um, we've been posting answers to questions that have already been posed to this frequently asked questions page on the uh, MAUSD website. So that's another great place to look for information. And then you can see the link here to the community survey. So that's a little bit about our process. And um, again, we're really happy you're here to participate in it. Uh, just a word about our format this evening. Um, so we are um, 
doing this in a Zoom meeting format. And we've, uh, you know, I think we've all had a chance to really sort of get more familiar with Zoom since last March, um, but we're still, it's still a work in progress. Um, we're really um, appreciative of the opportunity to have everybody here in this format where we can all be together virtually in the same space. Um, but we have chat, turned off the chat option. Um, it's distracting to really focusing on the content that's being presented. So um, I'm going to introduce Shannon Warden, who's the principal at Mount Abe, and she's going to talk a little bit about how the Q&A portion will work so that you can still be sure that your input is, um, that you have a chance to provide your input. So thank you again for being here. And um, Shannon, if you'd like to take it from there. Sure, um, thank you, Krista. So I just wanna point out a couple of things on Zoom if you are not familiar. Um, the first thing is in the top right hand corner of your screen, um, you may see an option for gallery view. It looks like um, a little grid and that will change your view so that you can either see the Brady, Bo Brady Bunch boxes or you can switch it to speaker view so that if somebody else is speaking, that's the only person that you're seeing on your screen at a time. Um, sometimes that's a little bit easier when there are pages and pages of people. Right now we're up to 100 participants, which is fantastic. Um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, over on the left, you will see a mute button. Please keep your um, Zoom muted unless you are called upon to speak. Um, over um, towards the middle, you will see a button that says participants. Right now it says we're up to 104. If you click on that, it's gonna open a window over to the right that lists everybody who's on the call. Um, at the bottom of that, there is an option for you to raise your hand. That's your electronic hand. And we will be able to see that. So when we get to the question and answer part of the evening, the way that you will get in the queue in line to ask a question is to raise your electronic hand once we have written down your name um, on an electronic list to ask your question, we're going to lower your hand. So you don't need to raise it again. We already got you on the list. Um, once we've gone through everybody's question once, if you have another one, go ahead and raise your hand again and we'll put you back into the queue. Um, and I think Krista, that's everything. All right. Great, thank you. So um, now we'd like to turn it over to Superintendent Patrick Green to share his um, presentation on next potential next steps for our district. All right, thank you, Krista, and thank you, Shannon. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking time to be here on this not so snowy evening anymore. The snow has stopped, but we certainly got some less than our neighbors to the south for sure. Uh, so last week, I recommended action that I think the MAUSD board should take to help provide our students with the best education possible in light of anticipated financial challenges. My recommendation takes into consideration the thoughts, opinions, and beliefs I've gathered from the hundreds upon hundreds of conversations I've had with a wide variety of our community members. It also reflects my knowledge of our education system, the ways in which I think we need to grow to support our students, and the harsh realities of our financial future. I made clear the path I think we should follow and also, also articulated alternative paths with the goal of helping the board and our community understand what we might expect our future to look like for each path that may be chosen. This recommendation did not come easily to me. There are many competing interests to consider and a lot of emotions connected to these interests. I wish we were not in a position to have to make hard decisions regarding our future, but unfortunately we are. Much as I would love to hand the responsibility of making a recommendation off to someone else, I accept the board's directive that I make a recommendation and I accept the responsibility I hold as superintendent to lead MAUSD. Though I'm confident in my recommendation, I know it has landed hard for some, while others may feel relieved. My recommendation calls upon us to face our challenges head on and take action to move us forward a more positive future for our students than I believe we will realize if we make no plan and take no action. As I shared last week, taking no action will result in several dozen positions being eliminated without a long-range plan to preserve support and services for our students. I think something that has been kind of shared back to me that I think is a, an interesting perspective to take, I think what's hard is we're comparing a lot of what we have now to the future that I'm proposing in my recommendation. 
And that comparison is part of what lands really hard. Another way to think about this is to compare the possible futures, not comparing them to our present, but comparing one possible future to other possible futures. So as we work through this presentation tonight, and as we reflect on my presentation from last week, I would encourage us to compare possible future scenarios uh, to one another as a way of thinking about what makes sense for us as a path forward. So I'm gonna share my screen and kind of walk through some more information. So there really is no doubt, we are at a critical juncture as a school district and as a community. Our enrollment has been declining for years and is projected to continue to decline. Declining enrollment results in reducing the amount that we can spend for paying tax penalties. Without reducing spending, we're facing millions of dollars in annual tax penalties and tax increases of 70 to 90% over the next five years. Assuming our taxpayers aren't interested in that level of taxation, we're left with the need to reduce spending. With personnel costs making up approximately 75% of our total budget, every situation involving significant spending cuts is primarily driven by personnel reductions. With the possibility of needing to reduce spending by as much as $8.7 million over the next five years, this would mean a reduction of approximately 91 positions. That's about one third of our staff. Making this kind of staffing reduction without restructuring will lead to significantly reduced support and services for our students. Knowing this, we can either cling to as much of what we have now as we can while we reduce dozens and dozens of positions, or we can look for ways to operate differently with fewer staff as we pursue improved outcomes for our students. My recommendation is to face this challenge head on and from a possibilities mindset rather than a deficit mindset. My intent is to light a path for us that allows us to build something together as a community, a path that meets our financial challenges and is focused on improving outcomes for our students. It is, however, not without having to make hard decisions. I know many people desperately wanna keep everything the way it is. We all want to hold on dearly to the image of our town school as we know it now or as we once knew it. The sad reality is that's just not an option. If we do not act swiftly and significantly, the schools everyone knows and loves now, or perhaps remember from their past, will be just a shell of what they are or once were. Letting the support and services that we provide our students rapidly deteriorate until everyone's unhappy enough with them that we're willing to make change is irresponsible and harmful to students. As our foremothers and forefathers did before us, I encourage us to make the hard decisions we need to make now to help ensure that we provide all of our students with the best future we can. That is why I recommended the MAUSD board take a phased approach, providing an opportunity for us to develop innovative ways to educate our children. To start us down this path, phase one of my recommendation requires us to repurpose our schools to ensure our students continue to receive outstanding core instruction, high quality intervention, and top-notch related arts experiences, while charging our educational leaders to work with students, staff, and the community to co-create innovative programming available to all students, which may provide an experiential, project or performance-based, hands-on experience. My assistant superintendent, Katrina DiNapoli, is gonna be talking more about this vision in a few minutes. Phase two of my proposal would be to merge districts with the Addison Northwest School District. That's the Virgenza District, for those that don't know that. This would begin by the MAUSD and the Addison Northwest School Boards acting swiftly to form a merger study committee. Then over the next several months, the study committee would develop articles of agreement to be approved by the State Board of Ed. Once approved, each board would then have to decide to warn a vote of each community. If that vote happens and there's a yes from the commingled votes of the five towns in MAUSD and a yes from the commingled votes of the five towns in Addison Northwest, 
That would result in forming a newly merged district. Ideally, this newly formed district would become operational July 1st of 2023 in order to benefit from financial savings before support and services for students are lost. This newly merged district would allow middle and high school students to access an even more robust program of studies than we can offer now. This would all be possible by creating savings from staffing efficiencies at the central office level, as well as at the middle and high school levels. In short, middle and high school programs improve and taxpayers save money. If we don't merge, we will lose middle and high school programs. This merger would also be necessary to be able to sustain the innovative programming in phase one of my recommendation. All students in the newly merged district would be able to access the programming described in phase one. So let's take a little closer look at what phase one would be. So in phase one, the Moncton Central and Bristol Elementary schools would become K-5 schools serving students from all five towns. These two schools are where all K-5 students from all five towns would spend most of their time. Beeman would be the site of an enhanced early education ELP child care partnership and the central office. Robinson and Lincoln would become innovation sites where the programming that would be co-created would take place. Sixth graders would attend Mount Abe, making it a 612 school. This would offer sixth graders access to the kinds of programming currently available to middle schoolers. Moncton and Beeman, uh, sorry, Moncton and Bristol were selected as the two sites to operate as K-5 schools for a few reasons. First, it seems important to keep a northern campus and a southern campus to mitigate travel concerns. The two northern campuses are Moncton and Robinson. Moncton has capacity for more students and is already very accessible to students, adults, and visitors that have mobility challenges. And to make Robinson fully accessible would require hundreds of thousands of dollars in renovation costs to connect the two parts of the building in a universally accessible way. Of the three sites that could be considered our southerly facilities, Bristol has by far the greatest capacity for students, has a separate gym and cafeteria, is most centrally located, and requires less transportation given the number of students who live in the village of Bristol. Beeman was chosen as the location for the Early Ed and ELP Child Care Partnership and Central Office because it's most centrally located in the event that the two districts merge and it's relatively close in proximity to Mount Abe and Bristol where a very large percentage of our students would be. Oops. So here's what Bristol Elementary could look like as a K-5 school. I want to remind everyone that what you see here reflects many assumptions and projections. None of this is set in stone. Uh, a lot of tuning would still, need to be, would still need to happen. This is intended to paint a picture of what could be as we consider what direction to take. Having said that, effort was put in to ensure that the FTEs that, that you see are reasonable based on the student enrollment projections and on the education quality standards. As you can see here, there would be approximately 351 students in the 22-23 school year. Class sizes would average 19.5 students. Kindergarten classes would be able to retain an instructional assistant. Students would benefit from access to a full-time nurse and counselor. All students would receive health education, which is not currently afforded to all students. Staffing would include robust supports for students from behavior support personnel, interventionists, and special educators. Classroom teachers would still be able to benefit from the support provided by two instructional coaches. Special area staffing levels would be sufficient to support student needs, provide some flexibility in scheduling, and help ensure we meet contractual planning time requirements for classroom teachers. As you can see here, indicated by the green boxes, the building would be well utilized with room for growth. According to the New England School Development Council, which is the consultant we use to help uh, provide enrollment projections, demographic information, and the capacity study for each of our buildings, Bristol has a possible planned operating capacity of 459 students. At 351 students, Bristol would be operating at 76% of that planned operating capacity. Here's what Moncton Central School would look like as a K-5 school. In that 22-23 school year, there would be approximately 171 students. Class sizes at the K-2 level would be in the 17 to 19 range, 
while class sizes at the three through five level would be 20 to 23. The average class size across the school, which is reflected here, would be 19 students. Kindergarten classes would be able to retain an instructional assistant. Students would benefit from access to a full-time nurse and counselor. All students would receive robust health education, which again is not currently afforded to all students. Staffing would include robust supports for students from behavior support personnel, interventionists, and special educators. Classroom teachers would still be able to benefit from the support provided by an instructional coach. Special area staffing levels would be sufficient to support student needs, provide some flexibility in scheduling, and help ensure we meet contractual planning time requirements for classroom teachers. As you can see, indicated by the green boxes here, building again is well utilized with room for growth. According to NESDEC, Moncton has a possible planned operating capacity of 235. At 171 students, Moncton would be operating at 73% of the planned operating capacity. In phase one, staffing levels at Mount A would look essentially as they do now, even though they'd be taking in another grade with approximately 98 students. Mount A would, look, uh, would likely look a lot like it does now with some, with some shuffling of classrooms needed to create a middle school section of the building that could accommodate those, those new middle schoolers that would be joining the building. The details of this would need to be determined over the next year and a half as we make that transition should the board move forward with this recommendation. Additional staffing efficiencies and program benefits at Mount A would be realized in phase two of my recommendation when we would merge with Addison Northwest. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. With the sixth graders at Mount A, enrollment's projected to be approximately 701 students in the 22-23 school year. And according to NESDEC, Mount A has a planned operating capacity of 970 students. At 701 students, Mount A would be operating at 72% of the planned operating capacity. And so now I would like to invite Mandy Chesley Park, who's the director of the MAUSD Expanded Learning Program, to talk a little bit more about the enhanced early ed and ELP child care partnership that I mentioned in phase one. Great. So you, Mandy. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Um, just a little bit, um, many of you know me. I was scrolling through so many familiar faces out there. But again, my name is Mandy Chesley Park and I direct the Expanded Learning Program here at MAUSD. And the work we do traditionally is after school, during the summer, early release days, vacation camps. And what we work to do is to provide opportunities for our students at MAUSD to continue their learning beyond school day hours. In March, when um, we're all familiar, the pandemic came to us, we were asked by the state to provide a three to five year old child care because we were one of the few programs that, that was open during that time. Since March, we've continued to provide that care uninterrupted through a summer program and through the school year. So we're excited to get to at least start to think about this potential partnership with the early ed program. A little bit of clarity around this is that um, the early ed program here at MAUSD is an incredibly high quality program and also offers 10 hours a week for our students. My own daughter attended the program. It uh, was incredibly impactful and it can be really difficult for our working families to come up with a schedule that makes sense for their child to attend an early ed program that's only 10 hours a week. So we started to think about what we could potentially do because this is what ELP does. We want always close to our heart, our working families um, to ensure that there was equal access to programs like this, this MAUSD program. So on the next slide, Patrick, <laughs> I'll talk about these points. So the partnership is, is essentially an effort to offer a full day solution for families of preschoolers who are already enrolled in the early ed classroom at BES. And again, I wanna be so clear about this because I have multiple children and um, others have attended other incredibly strong um, pre-K programs in the district. This is a solution for the existing MAUSD early ed program. Um, who will we serve? I already mentioned our three, four and five year olds. And why the Beeman Elementary School? This campus offers more space for programming like this to combine an early ed and a childcare program and to wrap around those, those supports. Um, and additionally, it's centrally located, like Patrick mentioned, 
So in an event that a merger with ANWSD necessitated additional classrooms uh, were centrally located there at that building. Briefly, what to look forward to. Again, increased access for families to be able to benefit from high quality early ed and still be able to work their full-time jobs and find the childcare that they need for their students. The expanded learning program is built directly into the school district. We are part of this district and we align the work we do with our strategic plan here around expertise and learning. So we continue to offer exploration, curiosity, movement and play all under the, the direction of the, uh, the path that we're following as a district. And as we partner with the early ed program, we'll provide additional educational opportunities for the kids that we are we are presently serving. Thanks, Patrick. All right, thank you, Mandy. Now I'd like to invite Katrina DiNapoli, Assistant Superintendent in charge of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment to talk more about some possibilities for the innovation sites that I referenced in phase one. Good evening, everyone. As Patrick explained, I'm here to share a little bit more about the concept of innovation sites. First, why are we exploring this idea? In addition to everything Patrick has explained, it's because MAUSD may have the opportunity to repurpose school buildings to offer innovative programming that complements, enhances, and supports teaching and learning. How might we do that? By modestly staffing two sites, by collaborating with teachers and students, and I'd add the community, and by designing hands-on project and performance-based experiences. We'll also want to ensure that the experiences we provide are aligned to standards, they're student-centered, and they're resourced appropriately. The idea is that the sites can be accessed by pre-K-12 students all throughout the year. Next slide, please. An essential question to consider when and if we begin co-creating these sites in committees will be, what need might an in-district innovation site meet? Consider all of the places teachers look to supplement or enhance their curriculum now. I've listed just a few here, and if you don't know what some of them are, when the slides are, are published, which I think they might be already, you can explore those live links. These collaborations happen through field trips, companion workshops, and by bringing folks from places like these into our schools, pre-COVID of course. Many of our schools have designed their own innovative spaces inside and outside of their buildings as well. And while experiences like these and others are often amazing, they can be cost prohibitive and not accessible to all students or all schools. So how might we collaborate and learn from these and other resources to grow our own internal capacity and design an in-house program accessible to all? Next slide. So let's take a deeper dive into an innovation site idea to help point, uh, paint Sorry, the picture. So let's pretend that one of the innovation sites is going to focus on STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, so a STEM center. It could be staffed by a director, two teachers, an administrative assistant, and a custodian. This trio of educators can design a menu of experiences, lessons, and activities that teachers and students can access as they plan for their year. The director can also be available to meet with teachers, teams, and students to customize an immersion experience that fits with their curriculum, attainment of proficiencies, and their schedules. The goal here is that all students in grades pre-K-8 access a STEM center collaboration in some various way, at least once in the school year, and that students in grades 9 through 12 have access to a STEM center collaboration as it works for their schedules. This access can look a multitude of ways where the STEM teachers can come into the school and work in partnership with the school-based teachers on foundational lessons, building up to perhaps a week-long experience at the innovation site. Once there, they could have access to equipment to design and create a product to showcase their learning. A high school student may choose to do an ILO, an independent learning opportunity at the innovation site, honing their skills with a STEM teacher mentor and helping to support younger students when they visit. These are just a couple of examples. There are certainly so many more ways a collaboration like this could work. Another thought we've been thinking about is a way to partner with um, a place like the Bristol Rec Department to open up the site for adult classes. That could be something that we could explore as well. Next slide. 
So if our school board decides to support the superintendent's recommendation to repurpose two elementary schools as pre-K-12 innovation sites, it will be important to pull together a planning committee to study the possibilities closely. We will need to engage all constituents and design an implementation plan that can work for teachers and students. In fact, student voice will be critical in the design and I'm sure they will be able to come up with many more innovative ideas than we can even imagine. Thank you. And thank you, Karina. So I wanna take a moment here just to acknowledge that my proposal for repurposing schools in phase one may feel like some to an, as, as an attempt to avoid having towns voting on school closure. And I can certainly appreciate that perspective. The reality is for the longest time, I could not see a path forward that didn't involve school closure. After many months of community conversations indicating to me towns did not want to see their schools closed, it really hit home in my conversations with select boards and community members. I was able to understand more clearly the value maintaining a school adds to a town. This prompted me to go back to the drawing board to find a way to achieve the savings we need while working to improve outcomes for our students without closing schools. And I recognize the repurposing that I'm proposing is not the same as keeping town schools operating as they are today. However, I do feel this proposal more closely aligns with what I heard from our communities than a recommendation to close schools permanently would. That is the spirit in which I recommended phase one, not as a way to avoid a community vote. I think what's important to recognize here as well is in repurposing those, those facilities as opposed to closing them, the district retains those facilities. So if we get the significant influx of students that some think we may from COVID or climate migration or some things go differently than we project them to go, we maintain some flexibility in how we address those things um, that perhaps go differently than we're expecting now. So that's another advantage to repurposing than closing. So here we start to look at some of the financial projections. This is a summary of the projected financial impact of repurposing schools in FY23. So that's the 22-23 school year. And what you see here is the projection with and without the impact of the student, uh, student weighting changes that I explained last week. As you can see here, phase one is projected to essentially be sustainable um, out to FY23, regardless of which way some of these variables that I referenced last week go. So you can see without the weighting change, we would be under the spending threshold anywhere from just under a million to about two and a half million dollars. With the weighting change, we would be anywhere from, you know, close to the spending threshold, but over a bit by around 300,000 to under the spending threshold by about 1.5 million. So those indicate that by NFY23, really in almost any scenario, we could make phase one work. Cursor back just a minute here. So here we see a summary of phase one still, but now we're projecting out to FY26. So that's the 25 26 school year, again, with and without the waiting study. As you can see here, phase one is not sustainable out to FY26 as a standalone measure, and that's why phase two is critical. So again, here you see. Um, if everything goes in our favor, we're just about at the spending threshold, maybe 275,000 over, which is a number we could work with, to as much as two and a half million dollars over, which would be much more significant. If the waiting study um, changes do take place, we're projecting that we'd be over the spending threshold by anywhere from 1.4 million to just under $4 million. So as you can see, additional savings are gonna be needed to to make this sustainable according to our projections. So let's take a look at what phase two would look like, which would help make this sustainable. So again, phase two is the merger of Addison Northwest and the MAUSD school districts. And in this merged district, all of the elementary schools in MAUSD could be used the same way as in phase one. The exception being that Beeman could be the early ed, child care, and central office for the entire newly formed district rather than just MAUSD. 
All students in the newly formed district would be able to access the innovative programs at Robinson and Lincoln. Ferrisburg and Virgin's Union Elementary Schools could become K-5 schools, with all 6-8 students from the newly merged district attending school at the Virgin's Union Middle High School campus, and all 9-12 students attending school at the Mount Abe campus. Now, I say this only to help everyone begin to imagine what this could be like. It's purely based on the larger footprint of Mount Abe and the fact that there are more students in a 9-12 than a 6-8. Which school would actually be the high school and which would actually be the middle school would need to be studied further. The anticipated enrollment in emerged six through eight middle schools, approximately 475 students. And the anticipated enrollment in emerged 912 high school is approximately 700 students. In phase two, the Addison Central School campus could continue to provide the same programming as is happening now at the Addison Wayfinder Experience Program, which provides an alternative education for Addison County students in grades seven through 12. Without a merger, middle and high school students will see significant reductions in programs across content areas, including English, math, science, social studies, art, music, world language, design technology, athletics, and activities. Additionally, students will have reduced access to support such as special education, intervention, behavior supports, guidance, and nursing. With a merger, Middle and high school students will maintain programming in all of these areas and likely see expansions in some. So here's a summary of phase two, uh, the financials for phase two. And again, we're projecting these out to FY26 to see how sustainable this plan is with and without factoring in the weighting changes that, we, that I've discussed. As you can see, this plan is essentially sustainable out to FY26 without the waiting study, even if some of those other factors don't go our way. However, when we factor in the waiting study, it looks like we will need some of those other factors to go our way to sustain this plan. I'll add here my crystal ball prediction, uh, which is that I think that the change to the waiting formula is likely to happen. And again, if, you, if, you're, if this is not clear to you, the video and the resources from the December 7th go a little bit further in depth on the waiting study and, and these figures. Uh, this is again trying to stay a little higher level um, to leave time for the Q&A at the end. But again, as we're, as we're making predictions, um, the waiting formula changes are likely to happen. So I think we can, we can expect that. I also think the change to the special education block grant will happen and that actually has a positive effect for us that increases revenue. I'm less confident but optimistic about the removal of construction costs from our equalized pupil calculation. Um, but I do think this could be an area where advocating to the legislature could be helpful. Uh, and I really don't have any idea about raising the spending threshold. Um, I have no indication if that's gonna happen. I know it's within the legislature's authority to override what ended up being a, a much lower increase to the spending threshold projected for next year than typical due to the COVID economy. And so the, the legislature has the authority to override that statutorily required formula, uh, which produces our spending threshold each year. Uh, but I'm not sure if that's gonna be taken up um, or if that would be gaining any favor in the legislature. But again, this is an area that advocating to the legislature on this point could be helpful. So the idea here is that in, in all likelihood, the combination of repurposing and merging is sustainable for at least the next you know, five, to, five to six or seven years with lots and lots of variables at play. I think it's also really important to remember the decision-making authority and who has what ability to make what decisions and so the community has a lot of authority in these circumstances. If we're talking about closing schools, towns have the authority to close a school permanently. The five town electorate approves, and, and I should be clear, the town where the school sits alone has the authority to close its school permanently. The five town electorate together in a commingled manner approve any budget that the board might put before it. And similarly, the five town electorate uh, in a commingled manner would have to approve a merger with Addis Northwest. The MAUSD board has the authority to determine what to put on a ballot. They also have the authority to repurpose schools, to set the budget amount to put before voters, 
and decide whether or not to even form a merger study committee or whether or not to put that vote on a ballot to the community after that study committee has done its work. As superintendent, my authority is to determine how to spend the money that gets approved by voters. Krista has talked some about the next steps. So as you can see here in December, we're having these community engagement events following my recommendation. Krista mentioned the electronic version of the survey has already been distributed. And we're anticipating getting the mailing, the paper copy mailed out next week. And then in January, the board's gonna be reviewing those community survey results and deciding what, if anything, to put on town meeting day ballot. It can be anticipated that in February, there'd be more community engagement events. And if there's going to be something on the town meeting day ballot, then we could see that happening on town meeting day. At the very least, there will be a budget vote taking place on town meeting day. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and I think we can turn to Adora for some question and answer. Good evening, everyone. And thank you again for being here with us. I see that on the participant list, there are quite a few people who were also with us yesterday morning. So um, thank you for your patience as we review a lot of the same information. It's really helpful to have all of you, all 131 of you um, here to learn about the complexity of these issues and to help unpack those issues through the question and answer. So I just wanna review with you how the questions, how you can ask a question. Some of you weren't here when the initial instructions were given. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little band of symbols there. Participate, participants should be one of them. If you want to ask a question, you can click on that icon there. And on the lower right-hand part of your screen, you'll see a raise hand tab. If you click that, there will be a little electronic hand that goes up by your name. The people behind the scenes will see that and add you to our speakers list um, and take down your hand. So once your electronic hand goes down, you know we've got your name on the speakers list. We have 10 questions that have been given to us in advance through our FAQ list and through other means. Um, so we're gonna go through those 10 questions and after that we'll start talking to the people who've raised their electronic hands. So our first question for you, Patrick. Hold on one second. Is this, has the district considered closing Mount Abe, making our town schools K-8 and then tuitioning out our high school students? Yeah, so this is an idea that surfaced uh, pretty early on in the process, last fall, early fall sometime. And I did look into this and, and as we think about how that would materialize, so if we first think about our elementary schools becoming K-8 schools, in order to provide the middle level education that we'd be looking for, we'd have to invest in the infrastructure in some of those elementary schools. So think about science labs and those sorts of things that are different at a middle level uh, programming experience than you might expect at an elementary level. So there's an investment in the infrastructure there that would be an upfront cost. There's also an inefficiency as we think about uh, the number of say seventh and eighth graders that would be in those buildings and thinking about if we stick with that theme of science, you know, the inefficiencies of the, the science classes in small numbers of middle schoolers. And so, you know, splitting staff between schools to, to provide that instruction creates inefficiencies that also add creating those K-8s, there's, there's a cost increase in all likelihood. On the secondary level, on the high school level, 9-12, we'd be tuitioning students out to, you know, some number of other high schools. And so we'd be paying tuition, we'd be paying the effectively the per pupil costs for those students to attend school in other high schools. Embedded in those per pupil costs, which would be somewhere close to what we currently are experiencing, we'd be paying the facilities costs for whatever building those kids are attending. Um, so there wouldn't be significant saving that is, you know, maybe in similar condition to Mount A and needs some work. Theoretically, at some point, that building is going to get the work that it needs and 
there would be costs associated with that that would be embedded in the tuition um, for that school. So I know there's, there's an interest in avoiding the cost to renovate Mount Abe, but my, my position is that there's no way to avoid facilities costs because our kids are gonna be going to a facility somewhere and their tuition will be covering those costs wherever they go. So from that level of exploration, it became quickly clear that that that, yeah, that idea also came early on in the process last fall. Uh, in hearing that idea, we reached out to a local businessman to get a sense of kind of what's the going rate and a cost per square footage for lease options. And in doing the calculations with the figures that we received, we realized we would need to rent out more classrooms and we have in total in MAUSD to generate the kind of funds that we would need to help relieve the financial pressures that we open our doors up to leasing space to businesses, we lose some control or it's difficult to control who's accessing our buildings and losing some of that to um, which is something to consider as well. So there are other benefits, but the financial benefits were not going to be sufficient given our expected need. Can the current superintendent's office be located in one or two schools but not pay out that money for the lease to use the, um, for the lease on the current building? Yes, I think. Uh, you can and I think it needs to. Um, and I think regardless of what direction the board takes, I think that's a move that needs to be made. Ideally, that move is made with some about what our long range plan is. build that move into a longer range plan. That's the better way to go. Uh, but our lease is up soon and, and signing a new lease, I, I don't believe is in the long range best interest for the district. So I think moving does make sense and that should happen um, really regardless of what direction the, the board takes with my proposal. What is the projected increase in the cost of busing students in one of those schools? We, I've reached out to company to have that conversation sort of explain the number of bus routes you know the routes may change a bit but effectively transportation costs in phase one would be cost neutral there would be some benefits it would give us an opportunity to look a little bit more holistically across the five towns about what our what our routes look like um, because the patterns could change so that could actually create some efficiencies as well um, so that it's it's expected to be cost neutral in phase one Again, thinking phase two, if that was a direction the board was gonna go in terms of the merger, we would need to look at that study closely as well, because again, as a merged district across the 10 towns, we'd have an opportunity to look differently at the busing patterns, seeking efficiencies as we're getting kids to and from. So there would be some costs associated with transportation there. Um, but again, the transportation costs, that if there were increases, when we think about the combined transportation budgets that we have, uh, I think would be negligible compared to the savings that we'd realize from merger. If school buildings are closed, how will they be used in the future? So if school buildings are closed, um, and again, to close a school permanently can only take place by a vote of the, the members of that town. If that were to happen, the town has the option to buy that facility from the school district for $1 and they would assume the debt that comes along with that. If the town, and, and then the town has the option in how to use that building. It is written into the articles of agreement from our Act 46 merger that the town would have to use that building in some way or possess it at least for five years before it could sell it. Um, but it could determine how to use that facility. And after five years, it could determine if it wanted to sell it. Um, in, in the meantime, in terms of the, the repurposing model that we've talked about, as, as Katrina talked some, it would be really co-created how we'd use those buildings and what the program would look like there. 
just a reminder that um, once we've taken your little electronic hand down, um, we have that means we have you on the list, so you don't need to put your hand back up. Thank you. In phase one, do some Starksboro and some Lincoln K-5 students attend school in Bristol or Moncton? Yeah, that that is something that we do want to look at closely. There are pros and cons to how we think about which school students would attend. Proximity is one thing we could look at. You know, there are benefits to students going to the school that's closer, whether that's Bristol or Moncton. I'm thinking about the South Starksboro students here than Moncton would be. So proximity would be a benefit in that circumstance. There are also benefits to students from the same town attending the same school together. So in that circumstance, it might be better for students from South Starksboro to go in if that's where other students from Starksboro were going. So we want to look at that more closely to see what are the what are the benefits um, you know, in which scenario do the benefits outweigh the, the cons in terms of what school students attend one of those innovation sites. And that's the exciting part, you know, as we gain process a lot of different people could bring a lot of different ideas and experiences to the table as we think about what program or programs and there could be multiple programs in each facility um, that we want to provide for our students i'm wondering what the point is of housing the innovation academy at schools that would otherwise be closed um i think there are different Different points. One, I mentioned event that you know things change dramatically in the future, and that gives us more options to to work with any new information that looks different than what we're projecting. From an innovation perspective, I think it's much harder to create innovative opportunities alongside of what has been sort of a more traditional look and feel in the typical school setting. Free a little bit of the structures and the bells and the schedules and those things that that tend to um, kind of go along with the, the more traditional look in a school offers some different possibilities that could happen for the programs to look and feel the way that we want them and hopefully as a spark for something that can transcend those buildings themselves. Okay, this one is a little long, fair warning. Emergency plan if phase two is not approved. USD and Addison Northwest cover many square miles and busing is a huge concern. Has the district looked into sharing resources without physically putting the students together, especially at middle and high school levels? It was mentioned open was not large compared to payroll expenses throughout the country in the last year. Apply that to combining resources since staff will be cut in both districts. You know if I've missed a piece of this. Um, so so what's the contingency plan if it is enacted? It calls to question or to sustain the innovative programming. The on the cost of programming is in the neighborhood of $1.2 million. So I hope to realize an merger would possibly need to come from that innovative programming idea. So that's one aspect of the entity plan. It did, you know, I don't. There may be some additional ways we continue. We've been looking for it over the past several years, and we've been settling on some, and, and other things have logistics that get in the way. So I think about a shared football team, shared lacrosse team. We often have students, um, I think, on our um, girls' uh, team this year. We share a
in many ways, the challenge there is, you know, virtual learning for some students, but there are many students for whom that is not an effective way for them to learn. So I wouldn't want us to put a lot of eggs in that virtual learning basket because I'm not sure that's going to be best for students. Uh, having said that, we can continue to explore that we find the savings that we would need to make even phase one sustainable. And I wouldn't find the savings sufficient to eliminate or even significantly minimize the programmatic impact of not merging. You got it. I think you got it. Okay. <laughs> Here's the next one. Will the results of the community survey be released and available to the public? If, for example, 95% of respondents vote negatively against the proposal, how could the board in good faith public to be aware of the community survey results? I turn it to Krista. Sure. Yep. So after the survey results are collected, um, we're going to be spending some time analyzing or having help with somebody who is skilled in this sort of data analysis to help us analyze the results. And then um, those will absolutely be made public as they're also shared with the board. Thank you. Okay. We're ready for the speakers list. And our first questioner um, is Nate Richardson. Hi, Nate. Hey, Dora. <laughs> nice to see you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, so thanks, Patrick. And, uh, and I think I, I have a, I have kind of a comment and, and a question, I suppose. Uh, and it's about the innovation sites. And so Katrina, I appreciate the details that you added to the innovation sites. Um, I live in Lincoln, where it's being talked about, you know, changing it to an innovation site. And while I don't support closing the elementary school, because I think our elementary schools are currently innovative enough uh, in, the, in their own right, um, I understand that it's a tricky situation. And so I guess the hard, the hard part I'm having is the lack of details around the innovation sites. And Patrick, I was on the meeting yesterday as well, and I heard the, uh, the kind of the rub there that spending the time on planning it uh, while it's not approved is, could be wasted time if it doesn't get approved. Um, but you know, in my experience and, and my work, we're going through budgeting season right now, and, and I can't go to my board with a proposal for something that I don't have plans for. Um, they will they will shoot that down, and I won't get budget for it. Uh, I also would not vote for a elected official who didn't have a platform and kind of said, "Trust me on this." Uh, it's, it's worked elsewhere, so trust me on it. Um, and the community is gonna build it kind of together. So I guess my first statement is, is I'm wondering if we can, I wonder if we can have more time and, and if the details could be worked out because you know, you're asking me to fill out a survey where I indicate whether I support a plan or not. And in all honesty, I, I can't support a plan that I don't know the details for. So at this point, I would certainly answer strongly oppose because I just don't know the details. Uh, I don't know the details, I don't know the budget. You know, Katrina showed on the screen uh, some examples like the Echo Center and the Flynn Theater. I'm sure that we don't have the budget to replicate any of those things. So I'm just wondering like, what, what is the budget? What could this potentially be? What, what are solid plans that we can vote on? Um, and, and so, those are questions that I know you can't answer right now, but that's more of my statement portion, uh, saying that I, I personally would prefer the details and I know how I'll vote if I don't have the details. And then kind of on the more time thing, uh, I, my question is if, you know, if we can have more time, because I think that there's, there's a community outcry right now. I, Front Porch Forum is blowing up over the last week over this. And, uh, and, and I think there could be some potential change, like you mentioned, uh, at the legislative level, given the community outcry and how much all of us are, are contacting legislators and everything. And so, but that takes time. It's government, so it takes time. Um, and then finally, and I'll stop talking, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you said 
you know, if the innovation sites are implemented and then things change, then us here in Lincoln and the folks over in, in Starksboro uh, would potentially be able to have schools again. I find that extremely hard to trust or believe given the changes and how it seems to go one direction and never back in the other one. So I'm just wondering if we did go down this route, is there any way that we could have a guarantee on that? That the plan could include a guarantee that if a certain threshold were met by students or budget in the future, then it would, they would turn into schools again, and that we could kind of bet on that as an organ, as a as a as a community. Uh, so that's that's it. Thank you for your time. Yes, yeah, so I'll I'll try to respond to that too, Nate, and let me know if I'm missing a part of it. Um, <laughs> So where, where I think I'm going, there's sort of a, a combined two, it's so a one part, but there's two portions of it. So the more time and more details, I think kind of go hand in hand. And then the, the other one being sort of the guarantee. So I'll talk about the first. Um, I hear what you're saying, and, and it is possible that we take some time to begin the co-creation process. The challenge is that that to do that process justice and to, and to build something that we can be proud of will take considerable time to get to the level of details that it sounds like you're interested in. And that that would be exciting. And I think we could learn a lot from that process, whether it's enacted or not. And so there, there are some benefits that we could look to. Um, when I think about our timeline, the, the concern that raises in my mind is when I look at the FY23 budget. So we're currently building FY22. So that's what people would be voting on on town meeting day. When we look one year out with a number of different factors that are, are at play, which, and this starts down the path of the guarantee that you're looking for, there's a lot of moving parts, so it's hard to give guarantees. But our projection for FY23, which is the budget we'll be building one year from now, is if the waiting study changes happen and we experience what we might expect to experience from those based on what it looks like today, and then we have the what I'm sort of calling the catch up year from the hold harmless. So for those that don't know, the legislature took action this year to hold us harmless from a drop in our average daily membership, which is kind of a count of our students. That has an effect of um, mitigating, if not almost eliminating a drop in our, our equalized pupils that we were expecting. And so that enables us to put a budget forward next year that doesn't reflect the drop in students. It's anticipated that that hold harmless will sunset. And so we're going to have to sort of account for the actual drop in students for next year and the actual drop in students for the following year together in one budget. So those factors all combined put us in a position where we might experience more than $4 million in reductions going into FY23 from 22 to 23 in that one year. And so, as you can imagine, having to find $4 million almost exclusively from personnel, because that's where the, the vast majority of our, our dollars in our budget are spent, that could have a significant impact on the support and services that we provide our students. So that's the concern. That's sort of the, that's what's creating a bit of a sense of urgency to take some action because this is coming, we've known it's coming, we've been looking, as Krista mentioned, we've been talking about this for quite some time and anticipating these financial challenges coming and they're, they're upon us now. So that's the time. And I think it's important for people to know that if we do, that's, that's part of the impact that we could experience. So the other piece that you were looking for was sort of the guarantee and what, I wish I could give a lot more guarantees that I get to give to almost any question that I get asked. I would like them for myself. I can't tell you how maddening it can be to have to build budgets and make so many important decisions without the information that we wish we could have. But unfortunately, the way the systems are designed, it doesn't lend uh, to that very well. So there, there really isn't any way I can give you a guarantee um, that some point down the road, if things change and we we need that space to bring them back to, to what school looks like now, that that would happen. I can tell you it's more likely if we retain possession of those schools than if those schools are sold to a town and a town does something different. You know, there are additional hurdles that 
get in the way of returning to what it looks like now if those schools get closed. So wish I could give you a guarantee. I just unfortunately can't in good faith. I just want to add that there is a projected budget. It wasn't tonight's presentation, but last Monday night's presentation where it showed um, a $1.2 million investment in the combined innovation site. And I will say that um, that projection is basically uh, based on the staffing that I spoke to. Um, and it's not set in stone, of course. So, you know, we don't know how much of the building will be used. So do we really need a full-time custodian at each site, for example, or can it be shared? Those details can be worked out. And of course, you know, it's, it's really hard to stop yourself from really getting into that, you know, brainstorming, problem solving, thinking about other funding sources. You know, there's so many grant opportunities like a center in a district. So I, I stop myself because it's, it's not supposed to be me, you know, brainstorming alone in this little room. I, I really am excited to do some of that thinking with a, a broader audience. But again, people aren't gonna wanna hang out with me and, and volunteer to, to brainstorm this necessarily if they don't know it's actually gonna happen. So it's a tricky, it, it is a tricky thing. But I, I did wanna clarify that there was a projected budget proposed in the more detailed presentation last Monday. Okay, Erin, you're next. Hey, Adora, um, I won't take up much time. I did have the opportunity to speak yesterday. So I wanna you know, respect that others have questions. But just to briefly introduce myself, um, I'm Erin Heisinger. I live in Starksboro, and my daughter attends in school. As I mentioned yesterday, the proposal, if phase one and phase two um, go through, she could potentially attend four schools in four different towns in the remainder of her eight years. So um, I have two questions. One, I'm curious if you've consulted with the town of Addison to see how they're quote unquote repurposing of Addison Central School worked out for them. Um, I spoke to townspeople of Addison who have said that repurposing has to them caused more harm than good and it did not benefit the students. Um, their children were moved to a school which, which essentially doubled their classroom size. They're struggling emotionally and socially. Addison taxes were supposed to go down and they're going up. If it didn't work for Addison, why will it work for us? And we're not talking one, but two repurposed schools into innovation centers. My second and final question is, um, what conversations have you had with Addison Northwest about the potential merge that could occur with phase two? It, it's not just the vote of our five towns that we have to worry about with this, with this merger. Um, I've also had conversations with Addison Northwest families this week, and one, they had no idea this proposal even existed, and two, when I did explain it to them, they were not in favor of it. Um, they were shocked to hear that their kids who would normally attend Virgen's middle and high school together would be split between a middle school in Virgen's and a high school in Bristol, or vice versa, however it's decided to be set up. If there's already clear pushback on phase two, which does require a vote, why are we even pushing in that direction? Shouldn't we have an idea whether phase two is even appealing to the towns before the, vote, the board votes to make such drastic changes? Possibly a survey to Addison Northwest residents as to whether they would even support a merger before the board votes. Um, where are we left if phase one is voted to move forward by the board and the public votes phase two down? Then we are left with three closed elementary schools and reduced staff for what reason? Thank you. All right, these multi-parters are, um, I'm doing okay so far. I hope I can continue. So make sure you jump in if I'm missing a portion. So the first question was, have I talked with Addison, with the folks in the town of Addison or folks at Addison Central School? And the answer is no, I have not. Um, the other question was, have I spoken to folks in Addison Northwest about the merger? Uh, interestingly, merger discussions predate me um, as superintendent here. There's been conversation about this idea for a long time. It's never really moved past conversation stage, but as our, as our two communities um, kind of work through in parallel the same challenges, the idea has come up more frequently. And in fact, the idea of a merger 
surfaced early on last fall in the community engagement events here. And likewise, likewise, we were hearing some of the same conversations happening in Addison Northwest. So there, there has been somewhat of an organic discussion started about the possibility of a merger. And again, my proposal is really for the board to act on forming a merger study committee um, that represents the MAUSD district, but would join in creating a, a study committee with folks from the Addison Northwest School District. And I know the Addison Northwest School District has already begun, their, their board has already begun discussing the possibility of forming a merger study committee. So there, I think it's fair to say there's mixed feelings for sure in their five town community and for sure mixed feelings in our five town community. And when I think about, when I think about the what if we don't merge, for example, or what if we don't repurpose here, that to me speaks to my comments earlier about we have to really be thinking about a comparison about our possible futures more than comparisons from what we have currently to what we might have in the future. And for me, if the option is repurpose and attempt to merge in hopes that we find the savings to provide the support and service for services for students that we want to provide or not do any of that, reduce the 91 positions, keeping our structures looking similar to what they are now. I think it's, it's, it's significantly um, more beneficial from a program support services perspective to pursue these other options Though again, coming back to Nate's comment or Nate's question, there's no guarantee. And we don't have the benefit of guarantees. I think pursuing something that could be much better and provide more robust program and supports is worth pursuing than what effectively is the default, right? So if the board, if the board doesn't act on my recommendation and there's no vote put forward and, and nothing changes, the default is we still cut the 91 positions that we're projecting we might have to cut over the next five years. Um, only it's 15 or 20 positions each year for the next five years. And we kind of slowly, or perhaps not so slowly, pull out the supports and the services that we have in place for students now. And then we look back five years from now and say, what happened? Then we'll see what happened. So it's really um, knowing there are no guarantees. It is in pursuit of something from my perspective that's better for students from a program and support and services perspective. Michael Fisher, you're next. Um, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have a question for Superintendent Reen. I um, have a comment to the school board members. Um, so first, I, I, I think it's really important to just say out loud, um, I don't question anyone's motives. I really believe that everybody shows up in good faith trying to do what they believe is best. And so I, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for your work on this plan. Um, I'm not gonna focus on the advisability of the plan in front of us. To be clear, I have deep and serious problems with many of the details presented here. But I only have a few minutes and instead, I think it makes sense for me to focus on the articles of agreement. I sat on the Act 46 committee a few years ago with many of you. Hi, <laughs> good to see you all again. Um, I argued with a few, uh, with many of you about some of the uh, articles of agreement. Uh, and then also there were places where there was really broad agreement um, about the words on the page. Um, one place where, if my memory serves me right, there was really very strong agreement about both Article 14, the school closure um, article, as well as Article 16, the school attendance article. And it's the combination of those two articles that I, I want to steer us to for a moment. Um, the school closure article was considered important enough, I think there was universal agreement in it, that it was included uh, in the article that was Article 10 that was put before the voters. Um, so it says, and I'll do a little bit of paraphrasing, but it says, 
the new SD board shall not close any school within the first four years of operation of the SD. I think that puts us till June 30th, 2022, if my math is right. After four years, the operation of the, uh, after four years of operation, uh, the new, the SD board may close uh, upon, uh, may close a school upon affirmative votes of the board of directors and the voters voting by Australian ballot of the member town in which the school is located. There's been a lot of focus on that article um, and I think it's important. Um, article 16, uh, school attendance says, the new SD board shall support and continue the elementary education of students at the school located in the town where they reside, unless such school is closed as provided in the article I just read, Article 14. Um, article 16 goes on to say that the board can adopt policies to deal with the needs of particular uh, unique needs of particular students. But the lead in language is just plain, plain and in front of us. Taken together, the two articles say, again, in plain language, other than to meet unique needs of particular students, students must continue to go to the school located in their town unless their town was closed in accordance with Article 14. That is, upon the affirmative votes of the member town in which the school is located. So I don't know how to fit the proposal in front of us into that legal structure. It would require a set of mental gymnastics to both argue um, that the school is not really closed, still an education site. Uh, and so we don't need to follow the article, the school closure article. Um, but at the same time, how do we deal with the um, school attendance article that says so clearly uh, that the board shall support and continue the elementary students of students at the school located in the town that they reside? Um, those are the words on the page. Um, it, it was interesting for me to go back and read them. Uh, a little more carefully after having not visited them for a while. Um, uh, I, I personally don't think this proposal fits in our articles of agreement. Um, if it was supported by the school board, I think it would be right for a legal challenge. That would be horrible. I am not proposing that or supporting that in any way. I think that would be a horrible outcome for, uh, for our towns. Um, but most importantly, I, I just don't think it passes the straight face test. Um, I don't, I just don't know, I don't know if there's a chance that the proponents of this proposal could possibly be successful. Closing three schools and sending the students from those towns to other schools without following the process as laid out in the Articles of Agreement. But if it was successful, I'm, I'm just really fearful. Um, we're setting up a generation of people in our towns, many of whom uh, have expressed a real feeling of disenfranchisement. Not good for our school, not good for our communities, certainly not good for our kids. Um, school board members, uh, I ask you uh, to please join me in opposing this proposal. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if anyone on the school board wants to respond or if we should move on and take that as advisory. I would say move on and take it as advisory. Okay. We have a lot to, to consider and advise before January 20th and that, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay, Emmett Mosley, you're next. Hi, thanks so much for um, taking my question today. Um, actually a lot of what I plan on asking was just addressed by the previous uh, question asker. Uh, just wondering how the school board members feel about voting for a plan which can close schools in all but name. And I really, there are many possible scenarios and ways that that can play out, but 
there are certainly no guarantees that those schools continue to function as robust educational institutions, um, given that statute pretty clearly says that to close the schools, you need a vote on the town. So I'm just wondering really for the school board members, how do you personally feel about that distinction? If I, if I could speak, Emmett, um, we as a school board can only deliberate when we're together in a school board meeting. We cannot go to someone's house for lunch and make decisions and talk. We're not supposed to really even talk to each other and deliberate outside of a public school board meeting. That's a sunshine law thing. So we need to take the information that we've been getting a lot of information over the last 18 months or whatever it is. And we need to sit in a room together and in a public space where everyone can watch us doing it and talk about it. So we can't right now make any decisions because school board decisions we all have to make together by voting around the table after we've talked to each other about how do you make a decision? You know, you, you get information, you process it, and then you come up with some sort of decision. So, and, and other board members might not have the same thing, but so we need to continue to gather information, meet at our meeting next week. You know, maybe at that point, I've thought maybe we even need another meeting before the January 20th meeting, because this is a lot to um, process and develop. So, um, so that's the process that we always do as a school board. We can only do it together at a table when we're talking to each other. We can't make any decisions aside from together, if that makes sense. I don't know if anyone can explain it any better, um, but thank you for the question. It's very important. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that clarification. Um, I just have one one quick um, sort of other question. This is for Patrick. Um, I understand that pretty much all the scenarios laid out um, account for staff reductions or sort of plan for staff reductions across the board. And I'm wondering sort of how many central administrative positions are considered uh, are being considered for elimination um, in that plan. Yeah, so in phase two, the recommendation to merge, that would effectively take two central offices and make them one. So there'd be considerable um, reductions at the central office level under that circumstance because by creating effectively one organization out of two, um, you know, for example, we could have one superintendent instead of two superintendents, one business manager, one like one of many positions um, that are necessary when there are two separate organizations. Um, and, and that is part of that recommendation. There's overhead costs that is necessary overhead cost in operating a 20 or $30 million business um, that can be made very efficient when those two businesses merge to form one $50 million business, for example. So in that, that proposal, there, there's considerable reductions. If the merger doesn't happen and we still are operating as two separate districts, there's far less reduction that can happen at central office without impacting um, the operations of the district. A good example, there are a fair number of people who have a significant portion of their job is managing state and federal grant money. If we, if we cut positions that manage those grants, we run the risk of those grants no longer being offered to us. And the dollars we lose in the revenue from those grants are much greater than the, the salaries of the people who manage them. So there's, there's risk there in not having sufficient staffing at the central office level to sort of manage all of the various expectations that are placed on school systems um, beyond leading, really just operating and managing the funds and doing all of the, the numerous and tedious expectations to, you know, give evidence that we're properly managing those and, and whatnot. Um, and, and therefore, there's far less efficiency that can be realized at the central office level um, without that merger. And it's important to note that over the past five years, we have reduced central office positions. Um, Floyd, our business manager, did a, an analysis of that pretty recently to see, you know, have those reductions been somewhat on par with some of the reductions in uh, other areas of our organization, and they have been. I think Floyd's calculation was that it was around the 22 or 23 percent range of the positions in central office that have been reduced in the last four years, five years. 
I think Floyd may be on, so he can let me know if I'm off, but I think that was the gist of it. Okay, our next speaker is named Patrick. Patrick, you're up. Great name. Hi, um, it's Patrick and Dina. Thank you for um, taking our question and comment. I, I really just do want to acknowledge that I understand that there are some serious financial considerations and, and all of the decisions that are being made or, or things that are being proposed are really trying to take into account the best interest of our kids. Um, but I think, um, and I agree with some of the, many of the points that previous speakers have offered. Um, I think for our common in question, I really want to frame this decision making in the context of our larger community. We are residents of Lincoln. And as I'm sure everyone appreciates living in Vermont in small towns that our school or elementary school is, is greater than just the academic excellence of our students. It's really the core of our identity and it's around which we all kind of navigate and connect with one another. And so, you know, given that, what, I, what I'd like to know is how is, um, is the is the district engaging in an independent professional feasibility study to look at the financial and social co potential costs of such um, a repurposing, which essentially to me looks like a closure, and how that's going to affect both in the short term, long term, uh, the cohesiveness of our community. Um, you know, for example, the desirability. The desirability of living here, um, the demographic shift that may result, how is how are um, taxes going to be impacted by these changes? Um, and so while I have significant concerns for all of the reasons that have been mentioned, particularly Nick and Michael, um, I think this is a broader perspective that I really need additional information, independent professional information on in order to make an educated um, decision. And I feel that because the, the impacts of this decision on our small town, both Starksboro and Lincoln, is so tremendous that we, should, we are owed that level of investigation to be able to, you know, exercise our right to vote and to be able to kind of come on board in support of this plan. So, thank you. Yeah, I guess the the short answer to, to your question, I think, is no, there has not been an independent study um, of what you described, and there is not currently a plan for that, and it's not off the table. There's, there's a time impact of doing that, for sure, um, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Okay, Tim, let's hear from you. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll just build off Dina, Nate, and, and Michael and say this isn't really a, you know, Patrick has sent a nice email from me earlier uh, responding to some of my questions. Thank you, Patrick. Um, you know, it's, I've been on the other side of an 1,000 person email evening, and it's, it's not always pleasant, but I appreciate the response and also many of the board members. So this is more directed to the board, but I went to Lincoln Elementary. I'd hope to return to Lincoln have kids, buy a house, pay taxes there. Um, I'm not alone in that. Uh, Anna Smith and a bunch of, uh, from Lincoln. Yeah. Um, and repurposing is closure. Um, even under normal circumstances, pre-pandemic, putting forth a drastic measure like this in a compressed timeline, um, you know, is, is concerning. It's rushed. Um, the four goals of Act 46, one of them is uh, accountability and transparency. And I think that those are presently lacking and it's not for, for lack of trying. I just think they're, lack, they're lacking because of the timeline. Um, there needs to be much more in the way of that. And, you know, Nate mentioned it, but we just need more information. Uh, people in those communities need more information. The, the voters need more information. Um, no shock, everyone I've spoken to in Lincoln um, and obviously myself, 100% opposed to the proposal. Um, and a series of issues, one of which is definitely on the wonky side I sent it to Patrick earlier and members of the board, but when you're considering repurposing or closing a school, you have to consider outstanding debt um, and bond issues. So there's a currently <clears throat> a bond um, that is not set to mature until 2027 in Lincoln. 
and you need an independent legal analysis as to whether or not repurposing jeopardizes that because there's investors out there that bought those bonds um, from the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank. Um, that needs to be considered well before a proposal gets sent around, in my opinion. Um, so that, I mean, that's really important. It goes to the detail side of this. Another important thing, and I, it's been informed and, and sort of talked about in the last uh, few days amongst my friends, but I think per capita uh, students in, in a small town, that's a really big deal. You know, how, Lincoln is the highest, according to the data that's available on AOS, AOE, it's the highest per capita students in the school. That's, that's tremendously important, in my opinion, as sort of a bellwether of how, in context, the school is doing. Um, and I think that's important. I mean, people may disagree with that, but I think it should be considered by the board. Um, community members deserve to know the administrative costs and healthcare costs separated out, segregated out from the per pupil. Right now, you see a big number, 16,000, 17,000 per pupil. Separate that out. Voters deserve to see that separated out. Healthcare costs, nobody can control that. No one on this call can control that. Um, but luckily, we have two amazing representatives in Lincoln, Mari and Caleb, and they can go back to the legislature and talk about these issues that we're struggling with here today. But administrative costs at the SU level, as brought up by prior speakers, and healthcare costs need to be separated out so we can see what those other costs are. Um, and it would be really helpful to know the increase in administrative costs since the passage of Act 46. That's something that legislators probably would like to know. How's that going? Has there been increase in costs in other, other areas? I'm sure that they know that there has, but it'd be good for the voters to know that. Um, the survey, I mean, I'll say that I responded to the survey. Um, it was a push-pull. Um, there's a series of pretty glaring omissions, the two of which I just talked about, healthcare costs and the cost of the supervisor. Those need to be included um, just so people understand what they're working with. Details are really important. Um, you know, I, Patrick, I, you know, I appreciate the crystal ball reference. I can't help but thinking this is just a huge mistake. Uh, you look back in five, you know, five years from now, whether or not there's 69 students at Lincoln or 169 students at Lincoln, because that's the current predict prediction, it's five years. But we don't know that, but, but I can say that it's a mistake to move forward with the proposal as it's currently set forth. It doesn't pass the plain, you know, straight face test, as Michael said. Um, you know, I'll just, I'll just focus whether it's a good idea or not on an emotional note, but the families and people like myself that went to Lincoln, um, I was in the middle of a law school exam and I frankly, you know, got a text from Anna Smith, a few others. It would devastate the community, absolutely devastate Lincoln um, and the five town area if you closed Lincoln's school, in, in my opinion. And I talked with friends from New Haven and Moncton. Lincoln has a reputation for excellence, opportunity, and equity. And Lincoln is the model. So I would say instead of considering closing Lincoln, look to what Lincoln is doing right now to have 30 years of incredible success um, in what they've done. So um, I think the proposal uh, needs to be voted down um, by every member of the board and due diligence needs to continue over the next year. So thanks, thanks. And I, I don't really expect a response on that. Just wanted the board to hear my thoughts out loud. Okay, Deirdre is next. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to just start with a couple quick assumptions and then move to a, a question. Um, you know, my assumption is that this is really complicated, that, that the financial team, the school board, you know, they would have created a plan already if we could have a simple solution. So what I want to just quickly talk about is the middle road. I, um, I'm not for keeping one school. I believe that school control should stay in the school. And I know people have said that, but I want to just talk about that a little differently. I remember Christian Blanchett at several meetings saying, all right, everyone, take a breath. We can't close schools unless school agrees. And I remember trying to take that in because I thought that was really wise on her part. And I did breathe. I literally breathed in my Zoom chair and said, OK, that makes me feel empowered. And um, my concern tonight was seeing the slide uh, that said that school boards can repurpose schools. And I just want to sort of zone back into that because many people explain why that's troubling. But I want to just say that 
when I say that, I don't say that's because we should just keep things as we, they are. Of course we shouldn't keep. There's no way we can do that. I believe there's a middle road that hasn't been explored, not because people aren't smart, not because people aren't creative, but it's just been um, a process that it's been hard to open up creativity. And repurposing schools is closing schools. Um, and specifically, I would just encourage every school board member to just acknowledge that. And if you think this is a strong proposal, then guarantee that vote at school, that you would not allow the school board to make that decision, but honor the act, the charter, and say every school, so New Haven and Starksboro and Lincoln would decide if the school would be repurposed. So that feels like just step one to honor the charter. And then the second question is, um, we know we have to cut positions. I mean, that's a given. There, there's, there's no way to move forward as we are. And so the question is what positions get cut? Um, and this isn't about keeping some old antique approach. I love the idea of innovations, the STEM approach, the thinking these ways. And I just wanna say, if we have the brilliance we know that exists in our, in our teachers, let's do it where it exists. Let's have the innovation explode in, in Let's have the innovation happen in elementary school. Let's not have innovation sites. When I think of a student in my town going to the innovation site for a week, that's not enough. It's not a good start. It's not equitable. A lot of students who struggle with poverty aren't able to come to school on and off for lots of stressors. So they miss that innovation week. That doesn't feel equitable at all to me. So what I want to think about is how do we think about what the cuts we're willing to make. And I know that um, there's been lots of conversations about the central office. There's really good people doing really good work there. And I know I'm not saying to slash the central office. That doesn't make any sense. But I do have some questions about um, what I saw on the website about 28 positions that exist that are behavioral coaches and teaching instructions. Again, really good people doing interesting work. But is this a time that we can sustain that when we're during an educational crisis? I don't know if we can. I just want to encourage us to the middle road. So my question to Patrick, just to finish up, is to say, um, when we think about the phase one repurpose, um, how many teachers' positions would be, closed, would be cut, how many staff, how many central office, and how many of those 27 positions that are not directly working with um, students in that capacity, what, would that, what does that look like? What, what, how many positions would be cut, and how much in that from those Thank you, everyone. Get into lots of details because it becomes pretty identifiable pretty quickly because we're a, a small enough district. Uh, the reality is um, there are reductions across the board in all of the areas that you talked about. Um, as we move forward, there has to be, you can't get to 91 positions reduced without going to every. Yes, we're willing to go forward or not with the phase one if we have, we don't have that information. So um, I would just encourage us to find a way to hold confidentiality and really provide that information. Thank you. Patrick, can I just add, um, I think you shared this yesterday morning that um, that's something you can share with the board in an executive session. So, um, so yeah, we seek more information and we do have the ability to hear a level of detail within executive session that will make us um, more informed without um, breaking that confidentiality. So I just wanted to acknowledge that because I thought that was helpful for me to be reminded yesterday. Okay, Daniel Lyons. Hey, everybody. Uh, first, thanks for putting this together. It's a very well organized Zoom experience. Um, Deidre actually just uh, asked my question. I was really curious about the staffing reductions that you know would have. Um, been implicated in that phase one repurposing. Um, uh, another question I have would be about, um, you know, earlier in the meeting, there was some discussion about, or some comment about the states, um, you know, working through or working with the funding penalties uh, for per pupil spending. And I'm wondering if there's any more information or um, 
is there any movement forward, uh, you know, from the state, you know, for those uh, penalties? Thank you. Yeah, the the session hasn't started yet. It'll start soon. Um, and it's hard to really predict what will or won't be taken up in the next session. There's going to be a lot of work to do with the, you know, still in the midst of the COVID pandemic and all of that. Um, I do think there will be at least be some discussion on on a few of the items that I mentioned. Uh, I don't know if there was one specifically you're talking to, Daniel, but um, I'm thinking about the spending threshold. So again, a little more on that. The spending threshold, um, which is the amount we're, we're able to spend on a per pupil basis before paying a tax penalty. And that's a really, really significant figure because that is the, the penalty is a significant, it's a dollar for a dollar penalty. So every dollar that we spend beyond that spending threshold, we're assessed a $1 tax penalty. So if we're 8 million over the spending threshold, we're paying $8 million in tax penalties per year. Um, and so that, that spending threshold is set by a statutorily required formula. And it's driven by figures that reflect the, the economy. And obviously the economy currently has taken a really big hit with COVID. Therefore, this spending threshold increase, which is usually in the neighborhood of 2.3% or 2.5% greater than it was the prior year, is set for next year at a 0.18% increase. So instead of 2.3 or 2.5, it's 0.18. Effectively level funding what we can spend per pupil. So when you level fund what we can spend per pupil and you have the same number of students even, if we think about the hold harmless, and your costs go up, your cost per pupil goes up, but your allowability to spend per pupil didn't. And so you exceed the spending threshold without making some reductions. And so we have a path forward for next year's budget, FY22, that doesn't exceed the spending threshold, keeps taxes you know, as reasonable as we can keep them, doesn't require lots of staffing reductions, um, and it's all really thanks to the, the hold harmless. It's really the, the effects that we feel for each year going forward, right? So not rate effectively, not raising the spending threshold next year impacts every year from that point forward because otherwise the spending threshold would have been higher in each of the following years. So I, I think that's something the legislature will discuss. I, again, I have no idea how much traction it will get, but they do have the authority to override this sort of anomaly of a 0.18 increase. That's something that could happen and that affects that spending threshold directly. Another thing that I think has a, a, a pretty decent chance, I know there was some interest growing around this idea pre-pandemic, and that's the idea to not have the construction costs that we have built into our budget count against our spending threshold figures. In, in other uh, communities where they pass a bond to pay for uh, improvements to facilities. You can apply for a waiver and they're pretty usually granted, I think, to have those construction costs not, or those bond payments not count against your cost per pupil. We've failed a few times to get a bond to pass for Mount Abe, but the board had taken action five years ago now, four years ago, to put $1 million in the general fund to address the needs at Mount Abe those $1 million do count against our cost per pupil. So the, the potential action in the legislature would be to not count those dollars against our spending um, per pupil. So that would have a significant impact as well. So those are, are two of the big things that I think the legislature may be discussing and may take up that could have a significant impact. And we talked about the weighting changes that would have a negative impact on us. I think the concept makes sense for the state of Vermont happens to impact us negatively in terms of our spending. Um, and I think those, those are three of, of some of the, the big uh, bodies of work that the legislature is gonna have to take up in this coming session. Hopefully, I don't know if that really addressed your question, Daniel, so let me know if I missed something, but it's my thinking. Okay, Jennifer Oldham, you're next.
Jennifer Oldham, are you there? Yep, sorry, can you hear me? Okay. I was just rambling on on mute. Um, so one of my questions is, what is the impact on the Lincoln Community Preschool, which receives federal funding um, as part of the Lincoln Community School for our early childhood education, given that the, um, the district is talking about moving to early childhood education to Beeman? Um, so maybe you could start with that and then let me ask one more question after that. Sure, thank you for breaking up a two-parter. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, it wouldn't have any impact. You're talking about the 10 hours that um, that sort of are, is a flow through the school. So for those that don't know, um, I forget what the, what the sort of act was, but um, it was determined a handful of years ago or maybe a little bit more now that families would all have access to 10 hours of free early education. And the way it works is schools get to count a fraction of an equalized pupil. And those funds flow through the school district out to um, our early education program that we run, but also many private um, providers like the Lincoln Cooperative Preschool and others um, to fund those 10 hours. Um, so this wouldn't have any impact on that. As Mandy spoke, um, the intent is not to increase the number of students that are enrolled in that early education program that we currently have. It's really more about building the child care component around that to create more of a full experience for families. So I don't think it would have any impact on that 10 hours that, um, that the Lincoln Cooperative might benefit from currently. Okay, thanks. Um, this goes back to some of the other specifics that other people have referred to. Um, you've said that over, if we didn't do the, um, the proposed plan, both the, the school, um, reuse of the schools and the um, merger, we would have to cut 91 positions over five years. Um, how many positions would we have to cut if we did those things? Yeah, the number of positions is, is essentially the same in any one of the scenarios. The, what, what I think is different is the programming and the supports and the services that we're able to provide at the end and, and how we use those 91 positions, right? So the idea is, you know, conceptually, and obviously we've talked about a lot of the impacts of these things, but conceptually, the fewer roofs the students are under, the more efficient we can be with our staffing and the more supports and services we're able to preserve. The more roofs that those same number of students are dispersed under, the less efficient we can be and the greater impact those positions then have on the supports and services that we can provide. That's the, that's the general concept from sort of okay. an economic perspective. Okay. Um, so one of the things I'm challenged with is, again, goes back to the repurposing and the innovation centers, which I absolutely love the idea. Um, but if we're trying to give more support and services to our kids, um, it's really hard to think that needing two innovation centers, both of which are on the fringes of the district um, is really viable. And it, you know, it, and particularly when it comes to no plans about what would be there. Um, again, I, I don't doubt the intention, but for $1.5 million and how, you know, you're already talking about cutting 91 positions, which can't be good. I, there's a little bit of discrepancy for me in thinking, yeah, that's really gonna be possible um, and that the towns are gonna vote for this. So um, I don't doubt the intention, but I do doubt the, the feasibility of it. The other, the other part, and again, I've been very informed listening to everyone tonight and I really appreciate what Mike and um, other people have said and just hearing, talking to my um, people here is, um, asking us to make a vote without full information in the middle of COVID um, on an issue that impacts way more than just our taxes um, is really not fair. And, you know, I, um, I understand, I know how hard it is on school boards. I've been on them to be able to get all the information you want, but um, Closing, you know, asking to close a school for a repurposed process um, program that we have no idea what it's about. We're still going to lose all the staff. Um, and I go back to, and I, I um, 
this has always been a bugaboo of mine since I've been involved in the schools is why don't we merge first and decide what to do with the school second? Because closing the schools, as Mike pointed out, is not re really statutorily even possible without the vote of the towns. Um, I know merging the districts has a lot of political stuff, but at least as a first step, there's nothing stopping us from doing that. It doesn't impact any individual towns and it can cost significant costs. So as I've listened to this conversation and how there's obstacles to this, that, and the other thing, the only obstacle that doesn't seem to impact the towns and the current operations is starting with the merger of the supervisory union first and then letting this larger supervisory union decide what to do with the town schools. So that's my um, my comment after, and I didn't come to this meeting with that idea. It's from listening to everybody. So thank you, everybody. Okay, uh, we have 10 more speakers and we're getting toward the end of the time um, that we originally posted this meeting to cover. Okay. So um, I'm trying to figure out uh, exactly how to handle this. Maybe if people could stick to one question, do you think that will work, Patrick? I'm not sure I can say what will work or won't work. <laughs> well, we have I can say it here for as long as we need to be. <laughs> we have 10 more speakers. It is getting um, kind of late, but we want to hear what people have to say and what they want to ask. There's always the, um, the FAQ that you can submit your written questions to. And I think we've covered a lot of ground. So maybe if people try to ask new questions or raise new points, that might be helpful as well. Okay, should we just carry on? Joan sure. Holloway, you're next. Okay, I'll try to be brief on this um, because a couple of speakers have brought up my concerns. Um, my first concern is that I think that the timing on this is terrible to push something like this through in the middle of a pandemic. We are completely isolated from each other. Um, I'm grateful to be able to gather here together without the chat function. We can't even connect with each other. Um, so I feel even more isolated from other people that if we were at an in-person meeting, we could speak to each other after the meeting or then um, those opportunities just don't exist. Um, I feel like this, the proposal completely ignores what the communities have said, which is that they prefer not to close their schools. And you can call it anything you want, but if you take five schools and turn it to two schools, that's closing three schools, even if you give it the name repurposing. Um, I would like us to be able to figure out a way to push this forward a couple of years. Number one, if we're going to merge, I don't think we need a two-step approach. That would be so disruptive to so many students. Um, and I also think that all of the numbers that the district is relying on are likely to change. The young people in this country are moving around. They're moving back at a fast and furious rate. And so looking at any study that was done pre-pandemic, I feel like you're relying on something that is no longer the case. I understand that there's financial pressures. I understand that kind of talk really well. Um, I would like to see us investigate other options. I'd like to see investigate reducing the educational coaches and some of the bureaucratic non-direct student contact positions. Um, perhaps we could rent out space to childcare and other community-based services in the five towns in order to keep all five towns schools open, but also to bring some revenue in. Um, so those, those are my comments. I feel like this is just a terrible time to be making such a huge, huge change in our community. 
Thank you. Pat LaRose, you're next. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm new, to, I'm new to Starksboro. I've only been here 14 years. I don't have children in the school, but I just, I taught at St. Mike's for 20 years and my job was eliminated, my department was eliminated because of economic concerns. I've just started subbing at Robinson and um, I just wanna thank everyone. The conversation tonight is so intelligent and I'm learning so much about the schools and about the people who live here. Um, I don't really, my first is just a yes, no question. It seems it's simple math, right? This is therapy, I think is the short oh, answer okay. to that. I would, uh, if you had, no, I'm not do the math, if you have the same number of students, no matter how many buildings they're in, if you have fewer teachers, don't you have bigger classes? Right, so this, this, this goes hand in hand with my wish to have more guarantees I could give. I wish to have more yes, no answers, <laughs> but they're few and far between, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, for example, I can explain, I can articulate if you would you like. Know, that, no, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking off the top of my head that that's an inevitability. If you get rid of teachers, you have fewer, you have fewer classrooms and the classrooms you have left are bigger. But, but yeah, so, I, I will allow that maybe that's not true, but. I give a 10 second example of that. So in my proposal, class sizes with students in the two schools would be 19 and 19 and a half respectively. And in the proposal where we don't find some of those efficiencies and we have to reduce the 91 positions in other ways, I'm projecting class sizes in the 23 to 25 average range. I see, I see very small classrooms at Robinson and um, as a former teacher, um, I, I don't know what the wisdom is on this. I always feel like the educators are the ones who should be so much a part of these decisions. Um, the fewer students in the class, the better. And obviously you don't want too few because then you don't have interaction. But the more kids, the problem here is that the population's going down. So we don't really need all these classrooms. We don't need all these teachers. That actually is the ideal. That's what we should be striving for is smaller, uh, you know, fewer, fewer kids in the class. I see is the bigger issue, and again, this is not really a question, it's a comment or an observation. Uh, and I just, you know, dealt with But the overall idea is that we all love our children so much, but we don't really want to pay for it. And so I don't see that as being the issue or the intention of the people gathered here. I see this as something that has to be maybe approached at the state level and see where are we spending our money? How are we spending it? And please understand, I'm so new at this. Uh, I'm, I'm used to college economics and I'm not used to this, um, but that it seems to me that's where and I know that's long term we have to change minds about how we spend our money and what's important. And what makes Robinson such a great school is that you don't have tons and tons of children in every classroom. And if, if the class sizes do go up, that's more crowding. Um, COVID isn't going to be the last time we go through this. And more crowding creates problems of its own, the bigger the classroom is, the more behavioral issues come up. Uh, you know, one thing just leads to another. So I guess what I'm really simply saying is the smaller the classroom, the better. Okay, Mary Miklas, you're next. Okay, I guess I don't see her name on the participant list anymore. So Marguerite Gregory. Uh, Adora, she's on mute. Oh, she's, Mary is on mute. 
Oh, I do see your name on the. Okay, Mary, can okay. you unmute? Yes, yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, I uh, live in Lincoln. Um, I've been here about 25 years. I had two children that went through uh, Lincoln Community School and Mount Abe. Um, but I also worked for five years at Bristol Elementary School and 13 years at Beeman Elementary School. So I have a pretty broad experience across the district. Um, I watched as my kids go through the, the population at Lincoln stay pretty consistent while most of the other elementary schools were dropping precipitously. And I think that goes to speak to people who moved to um, Lincoln specifically for that school. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm gonna echo some of the same stuff that pe other people have said about, you know, the importance of the school to um, the community. I had two very different kids and was amazed at how amazingly well the school did to meet the needs of those both those kids. That being said, everybody feels like their school is important to their community. So I get it. And I also understand the really, really tough decisions that you guys are making with um, financial decisions as well. Um, I do have one question. Um, I know you've probably thought about every single possibility, but I wanna go back to something that Jen Oldham had said, um, talking about like the fringes of the district. I think most people consider Bristol to kind of be the hub and um, the other four towns and therefore schools to be kind of spokes. Um, and when I think about uh, an offering that we want to intend to benefit all of the kids of all of the towns, I would want to put that in the hub, which would be in Bristol, um, which is I think part of the reason why the high school, uh, middle school, high school is in that hub. Um, but I think for that same reason, when I think about if I had to move things around, I would put the early elementary program and the central office and an innovation center in Bristol so that all of the towns would have sort of that equal access to that hub of services. And then each individual small town would be a spoke for that community. Um, so, and, and other benefits that I see to that would be, um, you know, we, we have, there's been issues or there's been concerns raised of um, both high school kids issues with high school starting so early in the morning. So I could see this really benefiting where buses kind of started more in the Bristol area, picked up elementary school kids, moved out to um, each of the smaller schools and um, delivered elementary school kids. And then at the same time, then picked up high school kids and brought those all into Bristol to meet um, so that there could be staggered timing um, and then kind of do that same sort of process in the afternoon um, that would delay the, uh, the high school to a, a time that's more suited for that age um, uh, group. Um, and so then that leaves Bristol Elementary School as a, uh, a to me, a great space for, um, to house the central office, house a early education program that all of the, the towns could um, participate in. I feel like in New Haven, there's gonna be very few people from Starksboro, Moncton or, or Lincoln that really is gonna drive that far for an early education program in New Haven. Um, and, and then that innovation center is really a, a hub for kids from all the schools to attend as well. So I'm sure it's one of the things you've talked about, but I'm wondering if you could really expand on why we would move those things that I feel like are central um, services that we wanna offer for all towns out into a fringe school. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So that that notion of sort of distributing Bristol kids out to the outer lying schools to sort of repopulate those schools, that concept is something that, again, came up pretty early in the, in the process last fall. Um, it wasn't so much centered around the, the early ed and the innovation center concept, but the distribution of students would be similar in the example that you just gave. 
And unfortunately, the as I was talking earlier, the the savings from staff that happen in a way that preserve the, the support and services comes from students being under fewer roofs. So when we have those students under four roofs instead of two, we lose some of that efficiency. And as you noticed in some of those financials, the even with the efficiencies gained by having students under two roofs primarily, were only just sustainable for a period of time. So to lose some of that efficiency and lose some of those savings that would be associated with that, um, or to have less, uh, less robust support and services because the savings have to be found is ultimately the reason why that idea didn't uh, surface a little bit beyond the initial investigation of that. But, but isn't the proposal keeping all of the roofs open anyway? So I guess that's my, that's my problem with the proposal. We're, you're still talking about paying for six different roofs either way. Yeah, that's true. The savings isn't really from, from keeping buildings open, the fewer roofs. For example, scenario that I proposed, we project, uh, I think it's somewhere around $5.2 million in savings. Um, might even be more than that, it might be $5.5 million in savings. Um, 240,000 of that savings is from the operational costs of two buildings. The other 5 million and change is from personnel efficiencies. So the, the savings doesn't come from not having to operate buildings, the savings comes from staffing efficiencies. So, in, and that's where in the example that you were giving, when we have our students under four roofs instead of two, we, we don't realize anywhere near those same savings as when they're under two roofs. That, that's really what it boils down to. Um, it's insufficient in finding the, the funds that we're seeking. Okay, I'm moving on. Thank you to Brian and Jenny Bates. Hi, can you hear me? Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask a question and thank you to everyone for the hard work that's been done investigating this issue. I have to say, I'll try to be quick here. I have to say that I remain pretty baffled by the repurposing concept by the lot. I'm baffled that we would need to bus kids outside of a school that's 75% at capacity, when even after students are consolidated at Bristol and Moncton, that we would need to bus schools, bus students somewhere else to experience innovation. I'm, I'm surprised that despite looking for cuts, looking for savings anywhere that we can find them, that we would be spending $1.2 million, $1.5 million to run these innovation sites when that um, by some quick math, balances out to maybe 15, 20 teacher salaries. And I agree with not questioning motives. So I'd, I'd like to just ask the question to Superintendent Reen, which is, in all honesty, is part of the logic behind the repurposing proposal that you believe that you're able to avoid a town vote through that proposal? No, not at all. Um... And, and the reality is the board could elect to put my proposal to a vote. There's nothing that would prohibit that. Um, I believe it's required, but it's not prohibited either. Um, for me, it really was, and, and doing a lot of soul searching, and I don't know how many meetings with Krista and Don and Kevin and our consultant processing what we hear and just um, searching and searching and searching, and it was in response to the community conversations that in recognizing the, the desire from the communities to keep their town schools and the benefits they bring that I had to find, I had to find something that found the savings that feels like a real thing. I don't, I don't put a lot of faith in um, our community supporting budgets that raise taxes by 70 to 90%. I just don't think we have, um, history would suggest that's not something that we becomes as they are and we trim and, and a lot of service and hearing the um, all five towns I met with select board members 
Um, you know, not too many community members uh, attended the Starksboro one. And then as I progressed through the towns, more and more community members attended. And, and I heard loud and clear that, that folks don't want their schools closed. We're hearing that tonight. We've heard it at every meeting. Um, I had an opportunity to hear more about why in those meetings and it, and it really just hit me. And I shared with that group as we, as we process and talk about the community engagement efforts and, and all of that, I had to find a way that didn't close schools because um, of that value. And, and I get people express that it feels like it's closing a school. I don't disagree with that. They know that I, I get that. I will also say that I think repurposing, though not what people want, is closer to what people want than their school being closed permanently. And that was the spirit in which I made this recommendation. Uh, and the reality is, so we, I don't have, my, my authority here stops at a recommendation. The board can advance my recommendation, they can put it to a vote, they can take something else to a vote, they can direct me to get more information. There's lots of different directions this can go. And my job becomes working with um, whatever the decision is of the board or of the community and making that the best that it can be. I was charged by the board to come up with my best thinking about how best to serve our students given our financial realities after 18 months of study, lots of analysis of the financials, and, and I don't even care to wager how many hours of just racking my brain about how do we navigate this. After that, it goes where it goes. Um, vote on something, don't vote on something. My goal was to make it clear if we choose path A, here's what I think we can expect. If we choose path B, here's what I think we can expect. If we choose path C, here's what I think we can expect. I'm not the decision maker on what path we take. My job transitions into making one of those paths, whatever it is, work the best that it can. It can. And I want people to be informed on my projection of what those paths are gonna look like. So when we do get five years out, whatever path we take, it isn't a surprise to people where we are. And tons of moving parts along the way. Can I ask a quick follow-up to that? Um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of concerns about the process here and how this is happening. Um, and I, I think that people feel they're being disenfranchised and we're losing trust in our superintendent and potentially in our school board, which I think would have huge ramifications down the road. And so I'm just wondering if it would make sense for you, Superintendent Reen, to um, make a recommendation to the board that they offer each town a vote on this. Uh, and that way we're getting a little bit away from the concerns with the process here and we can refocus on the problem and finding a good solution that people are happy with. Yeah, I don't know that it's my place to make that recommendation to the board, but I'm sure that's something the board's gonna be considering. Thank you. Okay, so we, uh, we have a number of people on the speakers list um, who haven't spoken yet, and we have now cut off the speakers list just because of the length of the evening. Um, so we want to remind you that we will hear from the people that we have on our list right now. Um, we, we did um, just leave it to people who haven't spoken yet. And if you still have a question at the end of this, um, please feel free to use the, the email addresses that were given um, at the beginning of the evening or, and that are available also on the district website uh, to submit further questions, or you can just send them to your local administrators. Okay, our next person is Amy Macefield. Hi, thank you. Um, my comment is really more for the board. And I just wanted to speak to the survey that's come out um, to the community and I, that I really appreciate your efforts to seek input from members of the community. And I, I have to say that I've tried to take the survey and I, I feel like I can't in good faith take it um, because I think it, what it, it feels to me like what's at the heart of the survey is, is getting back to what Deirdre mentioned earlier about as a community, we need to decide what are the cuts that we're willing to make. And one of the questions in the survey is asking us to prioritize things such as academic excellence educators, equity, and the social and emotional health of our, our kids. And for me, academic excellence encompasses all those things. And I can't, we can't have academic excellence if we don't have all of those things. And so I, I can't help but feel like that 
question is a little bit of a setup and, and a little bit disingenuous because it's asking us to say what's more important, our kids' social emotional health or academic excellence or our educators. And we really can't have any of that. We can't have that excellence without our educators and without social emotional health and without equity. So writing surveys is incredibly difficult and I appreciate that I'm sure none of the people at the board are professional survey writers or sociologists. Um, and it's, I, as I said, I really appreciate the effort to seek that input. Um, so I guess I'm just asking you to consider the difficult decisions and, the, and the, the difficulty in trying to convey the will of the people through that survey. Um, and don't take that alone. Also take a look at the responses in these forums and what's put out on Front Porch Forum and the, the letters that have been written to our legislature as well. I appreciate that people are trying to capture everyone's voices in the community and um, it's just one snapshot. So thank you. Thank you. Kristen Blanchett. Yeah, thanks. So I'll have a lot of time. I'm on the board from Moncton. Um, I just wanted to, to ask Floyd, who's our money guy, um, something and just mention two things quickly that the merger has kept taxes down in low population schools who have been losing students. Um, if towns were still individual districts, um, and I'd asked Floyd at some point, could you do the numbers on this? He's like, there's no way I can do it. But some towns would already be having to make lots of cuts if we were still in the five town model. Um, so that's something to, to just think about. And I know Floyd, you had said, it would, is too, there's too much to sort of fabricate to go back and pretend each town is still its own district and figure out what the taxes would be for those schools. But you said that you wish you could do it. So I wish you could do it too. I think it would be a good exercise. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and say I've done some exercises that allow us to look at what the per pupil spending per, per town is, allocating out as best we can um, based on students. Um, and, and that that's fascinating information, how that translates to taxes. Um, <clears throat> it's a little more difficult given that we no longer have town taxes. We have a district tax rate that is affected by the CLA. But I will say that um, in, in really simple terms, um, a, a town that has few students is paying $10,000 more per student per year to educate them than Bristol Elementary is. So when we as a district look at the impact of per pupil spending, and to Patrick's point, if we can get the, those students that are costing 40% more to offer the same services to because of the numbers being as small as they are under one roof, then we have the ability to get equity across the district. You know, equity can be looked at a hundred different ways. Um, if we're looking at equity in spending per child, we are unbelievable in our inequity as a district. But we overlook that in the hopes of getting equity of the resources available to our students. So when we're coming up on that spending threshold and our goal is to have that equity stay in place, we have two choices. Bring what we're serving, what we're giving to our residents down so low that we can afford it or gather us together in a bigger tent and allow us to continue to educate our kids in the way that they deserve to be educated. So I, I'm not answering your question from a tax standpoint, but I am answering your question from a cost standpoint per those kids across our district. So, so I'm just, uh, thank you very much. I, that was a great explanation. And so the, um, the overall Z guy sometimes is the merger was a bad thing, but because of the merger, some of the schools are still um, 
able to exist without exorbitant taxes to the people of that town. So I just wanted to point that out. And, and I also wanted to speak just for one second, I did this at the last meeting to the high school end of it, that um, looking at, after my daughter went to college and we heard what kind of programming and resources other high schools in the country and the world have, um, you know, we need to, to work on Mount Abe. And I think that I would like us to um, look, at least do the merger study and see if that can help. So thank you. Okay. Emily and Will. Emily French and Will, are you still here? Okay. We can't hear you. Are they there? They're there, but yeah, we can't hear. Okay. Um, I'll cycle back to you. Paul for Lenza. Thanks. I have two quick yes, no questions. The first for Patrick. Uh, wasn't clear about your prior answer about the Lincoln Preschool. Will the Lincoln Preschool continue to exist in phase one and phase two, and the kids will go or not? It will have no impact on the Lincoln Preschool. It's totally separate from MAUSD. The funds will still flow as they do, no impact. Thank you. The next question is for the board. Um, you got a tough job, I don't envy you. Um, I'm wondering what scoring criteria the board is going to use to measure Patrick's proposal against their criteria? Or is it simply subjective? And if you have a scoring criteria, would you share that with us? We haven't met yet after the other meeting to talk about anything like that, Paul. Um, we need to do that as a group together and we haven't done that yet. We would do okay. that at our next meeting, I would think, which right. is next week. And, and you'll share that? Those meetings are public, so you can watch, and yeah, then we could do that, right? Great, thank you. Okay, Herb Olson. <laughs> hey, there we go. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and anyway, so uh, uh, I did participate in yesterday's um, uh, meeting um, and I asked uh, the administration and um, the board whether they had considered, you know, pushing out the timeline uh, for a lot of the reasons that I think people have talked about tonight uh, in terms of detail, in terms of, you know, the just a short time frame. Um, it's a really stressful time. And uh, the answer I got, uh, I thought was uh, very, you know, I, maybe I'm reading too much into it. Um, uh, Patrick, you know, seemed to suggest the real deadline was building the FY23 budget. And that makes sense to me. Um, so uh, it seemed to open up the possibility that, you know, we could really, um, you know, spend a little more time you know, the thing about uh, the time is, you know, the board, I think, set out a pretty good process back in January of 2020. Uh, they listed out some essential questions. You know, they, they um, uh, set out a number of scenarios that they wanted examined, um, you know, set up a subcommittee to explore the financial details. And I don't think that's been done. And it, the, it's, pushing out the timeline would really allow for the board's process to really be implemented. And I think would give uh, a lot more credibility to the process and ultimately, uh, you know, help the community make an informed decision. So uh, the, uh, my sense though, from asking the question of the board was, well, we can't really do that until the 20th of January. And what I want to pose to people is that there are some dangers in pushing that 
a decision about whether to push out the timeline, you know, until the 20th, uh, you're going to have a ton, a ton of angst. Uh, you're going to have some real, real conflict uh, between uh, the board, the district, and uh, individual residents in the different towns. I mean, people are fired up and you're going to get a lot of conflict. You know, um, is that really, you know, what you want to do? There, there are people talking all sorts of stuff. You know, uh, you're going to see petitions in town meetings, you know, around voting about closing schools. There are some people talking about withdrawing from the district. I don't think you want to go there. You know, to me, the, 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 what makes sense uh, is, is to push it off. Uh, I buy, you know, Patrick's timeline. timeline. You got to make some decisions about getting the finances in order before the 2000, fiscal year two, 2023 budget. No, I think it's that. <laughs> and, and but that's that's sometime next year. You know, say October two thousand and twenty-one. Uh, and it just seems to make uh, a lot more sense for me. You know, uh, and I guess my question would be, and, and I, I guess I would pose it to the 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 board. I think they're having a meeting next um, Tuesday. I think it is, or sometime next week, uh, to put on their agenda consideration of whether to postpone this process until the next fiscal year, October, you know, 2021 or whatever makes, whatever is appropriate. Uh, and I'm wondering whether the board will consider that. Okay, Emily Let's French, are you available? Adora, can I just um, sure. make a comment quickly? Sure. I think, um, you know, we're really committed to allowing people to have a chance to share input in ways beyond just Zoom to really make sure that folks for whom this medium is just not accessible can participate. And to do that, we need to give people time to receive the mail survey, which does have some open-ended questions, and to look at those results. And so I, I understand... Um, Believe me, I, I feel the angst as well. Um, but I think that it's so important that we have a really robust conversation at the board table. And without having the survey results back, uh, I don't think we could do that. So if, from my perspective, and I'm just speaking as one board member, and we might decide at our December meeting to do something else, but as the chair of the community engagement committee, I'd strongly advocate that we wait until the survey results were back before we had that conversation. Yeah, I appreciate that because uh, I guess my perspective is, you know, and I appreciate that totally. Uh, there's going to be some harm that comes from that as well, uh, pushing it out to, you know, uh, end of January and town meeting votes and all the angst is going to happen. Um, because people are going to have to make decisions about what they're going to do at town meeting before you meet. So it's not like people can wait until the 20th and then, oh, okay, we'll, we'll decide what to do. They're going to have to put things in motion around town meeting and petitions in the individual towns before then. Uh, so there's, there's going to be a cost. That's all. Okay. Emily, are you, Emily French, are you there? <laughs> Poor They're guy. here, but we still can't hear them. Yeah, mute issue. I think the, the mic is broken. They just put up a sign. Oh. The mic is broken. Okay. Bummer. Okay. So, Dash, on to you. Hi, thanks everybody. I have, I have two quick comments and I, I promise I'll be quick at this late hour. Uh, the first is I want to say thank you to Patrick for what is an incredibly difficult but pragmatic proposal. I, I appreciate the valid concerns that have been reached tonight, but the way I see it, this is a proposal that's put forth by a superintendent that if it goes through and we merge, he might put a proposal that puts himself out of a job in two years. This is a kind of proposal from somebody who clearly cares about the long-term health 
of this district, of the students and of these communities, perhaps even over his own job. And so with that, I have to give my strongest thanks and appreciation for you really putting forth your best proposal for this community. The second comment is about community, a theme that we've heard throughout the night. And this is maybe directed at the school board and maybe the broader community that's here today. One of the strange things to me about this discussion about community is how it seems to end at the borders of our town. The majority of these comments tonight have been about our local community, irrespective of the fact that we're kind of all in this together. Maybe I'm naive in this matter, right? I've been in Bristol for seven years. I've been all over the country, right? But from my perspective, I don't know the difference between somebody who lives in Lincoln and someone who lives in Bristol, who lives in New Haven, who lives in Starksboro. And so I asked the board and I asked those who've been commenting, commenting tonight to try to take pause on what is an incredibly difficult topic and think about what community really is. And if community means the five towns and maybe even beyond that, what does that mean for what we need to do for these schools? That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Hey guys, thank you for um, staying so late to take our questions. Um, my question is specifically for uh, Superintendent Reen. Um, I was just wondering what factors led to the decision to choose to turn Lincoln into one of the innovation sites? Because it seems like with the data information that we have available that Lincoln has a consistent population, it's done very well with test scores um, and with student retention. So it seems like of the options that be a school that we should be proud of. And as previous speakers have spoken to, should be a school that we champion as opposed to closing. So I was wondering if you could speak to the uh, factors that led to that, that choice. Thank you. Sure, so a, a couple of things. Um, I guess the first is, I would agree that for a long time, the population in Lincoln was stable. That is not currently true. So five years ago, Lincoln's population was 116 students. This year, it's 84. Five years from now, it's projected to be 69. So that is anything but a stable population. Um, beyond that, really, the, the decision about Lincoln being an innovation site was more about if we're putting students under fewer roofs, because that's where the efficiency um, comes from staffing. So, and, and again, that efficiency saves the dollars that we need to save and maintains or in many cases enhances the support and services that are so important to uh, supporting our students. And so really it came down to what if we're putting our students under fewer roofs, um, perhaps not quite as few roofs as possible, but almost as few roofs as possible. We could maybe almost squeeze all of our K-5 kids into Bristol, but it would be busting at the seams. Um, and so in looking at what two sites then made the most sense, um, that was sort of the perspective I took. And as I said in my presentation, Bristol and Moncton were the two sites selected uh, in part to have a Northern and a Southern campus. The Northern campus options being Moncton and Robinson. Moncton's layout, A, it has more capacity for students. So that offers more flexibility. Its layout is also much more accessible. Um, Robinson's layout would take considerable renovation to make it universally accessible. So that was sort of the, the logic behind the selection of Moncton as the northern campus. And then Bristol of the three sort of more southern campuses, by far, obviously the largest, um, largest capacity for students, most accessible, um, all those reasons that I mentioned before. Proximity, you know, a number of students living in the village. Uh, there aren't too many students that walk to school in Lincoln or walk to school in Moncton or, or those other schools because the, the town center isn't as prominent as the town center in Bristol. So those are, are really all the factors that led to why the two schools were selected as the sites for the K-5 schools. Um, I mentioned that Beeman was selected as the, the central office and the early ed and child care partnership because of its uh, sort of relative central location. Uh, and that then meant that uh, Robinson and Lincoln would be the sites for the innovation sites. That was the thinking behind those selections. Thank you. Okay, the last speaker we have on our list is Mary Beth. 
Thank you. Um, there's so many different directions I could take thoughts, but I'm going to try to focus. So this is to the school board. And I completely appreciate the concept of not closing schools. I believe in small schools for all towns, not just Lincoln. And I don't think this is just about an individual town. I do think though, when you talk to people in their town, the concept of why they wanna keep their school is because of the heart of the town being the school and the children of that town being in the school and the community members being in that school. So I would ask the board to think about the fact that, and other people have said this, but I just want you guys to think about it. Repurposing a school is repurposing a building, but it is closing a school. You are taking the children of the town and sending them to another town. So you are closing the town school and whether that's the right or wrong thing to do, I really do believe the town has the right to vote for that. And I know Patrick said he couldn't ask you to do that, but I'm asking the board to consider the town's voice because it does have a huge implication on a town when a school closes. And there's so many semantics between what that building will be, but it won't be the town school. And so I would just ask you to consider taking the towns into consideration when you vote on his proposal. I want to thank everyone so much for spending time tonight mulling over these difficult issues. Um, and everyone was so articulate and patient and listening to each other. And we still have most of the crowd here. It's kind of amazing. So thank you for your time and your thoughtfulness. Patrick, is there anything you'd like to close with? No, I'll just echo what you were saying, Adora. Really appreciative. A lot of different perspectives. I think um, what I really appreciate tonight was the, the assumption of good intentions that isn't always true. Um, I felt like it was true tonight and that's appreciated because I think what, what is important to keep in mind is we really are all after the same thing. We all want what's best for our students. We have disagreements about what that is and what the path is to take to get there. I think that's a healthy disagreement to have and healthy conversations to have and we can do it respectfully. And I felt like we did that tonight. So I really appreciate that approach that everyone brought to the meeting, um, knowing that we're really all in pursuit of that. And, and thanks for sticking it out. It was a long meeting on a long day. Snow was out there. I'm sure you all played in the snow and are exhausted. Uh, but I just appreciate the, the interest in becoming more informed and, and the opportunity to hear more thoughts. So thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Thank you.